Having covered the benefits of transgenic crops, I'd now like to have a look at how we actually construct transgenic plants. And the first thing to have a look at is the kind of genes that go into the plasmid construction. So I've already talked about a number of useful genes that we can put in, but we need to put in other genes into our plasmid as well. And typically, as well as your useful gene, you'd have a gene for a visible marker and a selectable marker. So it's pertinent now to talk about selection. In agriculture generally, in plant breeding, we normally select at the level of the intact plant. So for example in potato breeding, a potato breeder, which is carried out in uh, Chagas Carlo at the Oak Park Research Centre, they may do a sexual cross between two interesting useful varieties of potato and from that they may get 20,000 seedlings. They'll plate these out or grow them in the field and every year they may rogue out at least half of them, but more like 90% of the plants. And they keep on doing this until they've actually got one plant which is going to form the basis of a new variety. Now it's possible to do this but it's very labour intensive and it takes a long time. In culture the single cell is the selection unit and it's possible to plate out a million cells or more on a petri dish and then select single cells on that petri dish. And it's usual to carry out a progressive selection over a number of phases but we're not talking years here in terms of selection, we're talking months. So it's possible to get a transgenic plant in a matter, under optimal conditions, in a matter of weeks rather than over a period of 20 years of selection as you would in the intact plant. The selection is needed because the transformation frequency is low. So the maximal transformation frequency that I've ever uncovered in any uh, plant cell culture system is 3%. That is 3% of the cells were actually transformed. And it's normally much, much, much lower than this. You may have one cell in 100,000 transformed or one cell in a million. And these non-transformed cells will overgrow the transformed cells unless you have a means for preferentially selecting for the transformed cells. So it's usual to use a positive selective agent in order to do this. And some of the most useful are antibiotic resistance. So for example you will find that a commonly used gene that's put into uh, plasmids for selection is this gene here, neomycin phosphotransferase 2, which phosphorylates canamycin group antibiotics. So it's usually abbreviated to NPT2. But there are other antibiotics we can use and there are other agents that we can actually use as positive selection agents. In terms of selection strategies, I've just mentioned positive strategies, but there are negative strategies, visual strategies and analytical screening. Positive select selection relies on adding a toxic compound to the medium. Only the cells that can tolerate it or can degrade it will actually survive. And you just play it out and pick off the growing, growing colonies. But you do need a strong selection pressure and you will get escapes. An escape is a non-transformed colony which is growing on the toxic compound. And for example it is a particular problem with things like canamycin. So any agent which decontaminates the actual or destroys the actual compound itself, in this case canamycin is phosphorylated by neomycin phosphotransferase if there are cells sitting on top of the callus that don't actually have that particular gene, they'll be protected by the cells underneath which have decontaminated the canamycin. 
In some instances we want to carry out a negative selection. So for example, uh, if you want to isolate nitrate reductase mutants, these are nitrate reductase neg negative mutants that don't actually have a high level of nitrate reductase expression, you can't do it by positive selection. What you do is use the negative selection instead. So nitrate reductase will actually change chlorate to chlorite. Chlorate, chlorate is relatively non-toxic, chlorite is very toxic. So if you want to identify nitrate reductase negative mutants, then you can do this using chlorate. So only those cells that are not expressing nitrate reductase will actually survive. So this is a useful method for developing auxotrophs. Auxotrophs are used for looking at gene expression and for looking at the activity of particular enzymes. It's much more usual nowadays to actually to use, put in antisense to a particular gene that we're interested in, rather than trying to use negative selection. One thing that is used very, very extensively is uh, visual selection. So it's only useful for coloured or fluorescent compounds, for example, green fluorescent protein from jellyfish. So normally you, the normal protocol is to plate out your cells and you pick off the coloured or fluorescent compounds. And using this it's possible to screen millions of cells in a day's work. And there are two visible markers that are predominantly used in plant cell transformation work. These are the GUS gene, the beta-glucuronidase gene from E. coli and the green fluorescent protein gene from jellyfish. You probably know from your BT3 micro uh, practicals that one of the tests you carried out was for E. coli. So you plated cells out on a particular medium that contained a substrate it happened to be this thing here, exclue, and you got blue colonies if E. coli was present. So that particular gene has been taken out of E. coli and is used in the plasmid for plant transformation. So you end up with a blue colour from a colourless substrate, exclue. And there's also a substrate, methyl umbiliferyl glucuronide, which actually will fluoresce and gives you a quantitative, a very sensitive quantitative assay for transformation. There are some problems with using beta-glucuronidase. One of the biggest problems is that cells are not permeable to this substrate exclu. So before you can actually show transformation you need to permeabilize the cells. In permeabilizing the cells you kill them off. So you can say, well, you know, I've got transformation there. Unfortunately, the cells are dead. So it's not as useful as a non-destructive assay. One of the ways around this is to add in secretory signals onto your GUS gene. So you get the protein excreted into the cell wall space, the apoplast, and active there, where it can actually interact with the substrate exclude. But this compound here, GFP, green fluorescent protein, is increasingly being used instead. And this fluoresces green under UV illumination, so it's non-destructive. All you need is a strong fluorescent light, you put it over the top of your petri dish, any transformed colonies will fluoresce green. There were problems, it was believed that there was a cryptic intron in the GFP gene. So this is a piece of the DNA that was recognised as an intron and spliced out in plants but was not recognised as an intron in jellyfish. Now that problem has been resolved. I did talk with uh, some experts in plant transformation from John Inner's Institute in the UK where they're doing a lot of work and they reckoned it was just, you just needed a strong fluorescent lamp. But it has now been used for selection on its own. And the third thing is analytical screening. Having shown that you actually have coloured colonies by either beta-glucuronidase gene or by GUS gene, uh, sorry, a GFP gene, 
and shown that they are able to grow on medium containing these uh, poisonous substances, you need to prove that the gene is there. So you need to do some kind of analytical screening. And to do this analytical screening, you need to cut each piece of callus in two. Half of it will be subcultured, the other half will be extracted and analysed. And it's this extraction and analysis which is laborious and it limits the number of explants that can be analysed to round about 200 per day. So your gene needs a plant specific promoter. And this will apply for, so you're going to have to put in a gene for your particular product you're interested in. You're going to have to put in a gene for your positive selection agent like the NPT2 gene. You're going to have to put in a gene for your visible marker like the green fluorescent protein. And each of these will have a similar structure and it's got to have a plant specific promoter. If it doesn't have a plant specific promoter then it won't be expressed in plants and you won't see anything. You can use plant promoters themselves and these are increasingly being used but very often you'll find that the promoters actually come from organisms that will infect plants and get expression of their own genes in plants. And The two that are most commonly used are agrobacterium and viruses. So you, you'll find that people use, for example, the agrobacterium nopline synthase promoter. Okay, so your plant specific promoter will then allow transcription of your DNA on your plasmid into messenger RNA. In order for that messenger RNA to be transcribed, translated into protein, you need a plant ribosome binding site. Bacterial ribosome binding sites won't do. You see in blue there I've got a poly A tail. So you've got messenger RNA transcribed from your DNA and that all happens in the nucleus. But the translation of your messenger RNA into proteins happens in the cytoplasm. So your messenger RNA has to get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm and the mechanism by which that happens is through recognition of a site on the end of the messenger RNA by the nuclear pore. So you need to put on a poly A tail onto your, uh, on your messenger RNA in order for it to get out of the nucleus. When it's in the cytoplasm the messenger RNA will be translated into protein so you end up with a polypeptide chain. Now this polypeptide chain can then condense into a protein in the cytoplasm itself to give you a functional uh, protein or enzyme, but it can also be specifically targeted to organelles within the plant itself. So for example you can specifically target proteins to chloroplast or the mitochondrion or to the Golgi for export out into the cell wall space. In order to do this you need to add in what I have here in mauve which is a signal peptide. 